Okay, so we in Queens. These events take place decades ago, and much has happened since these times. That only means that there will be a part two. Today's story is about the prosecution of a bunch of guys in connection with their participation in the activities of a gang known as the Supreme Team, whose business was the distribution of crack by means of a RICO enterprise conducted through a campaign of violent enforcement and retribution. At the trial of Gerald Miller, also known as Prince, the government presented voluminous evidence, including tapes and transcripts of more than 100 wiretapped conversations among Supreme Team members, crime scene photographs, telephone records, fingerprint evidence, photographs of assembled Supreme Team members, firearms and ammunition, narcotics paraphernalia, and assorted documents. Among the government's approximately 80 witnesses at that trial were former accomplices including Ernesto Piniella, the gang's chief of security, Julio Hernandez, a member of the gang's security force, Trent Morris, the gang's primary drug courier, Tony McGee, a gang associate, and Ina McGriff, a corrupt former New York State parole officer who had sold information to the gang. Scores of federal and state law enforcement officers testified about the discovery of homicide victims killed by the Supreme Team, crime scene analysis, searches, surveillances, and other investigative activities. The Supreme Team was a street gang organized in the early 1980s in the vicinity of the Basley Park houses in Jamaica, Queens, New York, by a group of teenagers who were members of a quasi-religious sect known as the Five Percenters. Under the leadership of Kenneth Supreme McGriff, with Prince, his nephew, as second in command, the gang concentrated its criminal efforts on the widespread distribution of crack cocaine. At its 1987 peak, the Supreme Team's receipts exceeded $200,000 a day, and the gang regularly committed acts of violence and murder to maintain its stronghold on the area's drug trade. After McGriff went to jail in 1987, leadership of the Supreme Team was assumed by Prince. Prince solidified his control by increasing the security force and employing it against rivals and against team members suspected of disloyalty. During 1987 alone, Prince and the then incarcerated McGriff ordered at least eight homicides. The Supreme Team's narcotics operations used dozens of employees, including layers of drug sellers, to insulate the gang leaders from the street-level activity. Team members communicated in coded language and numerical systems. To thwart law enforcement efforts further, Prince used armed bodyguards and deployed sentinels with two-way radios on rooftops. The sophistication of the gang's operation enabled it to survive the periodic targeting of various members for prosecution by the New York City Police Department and the Queens County District Attorney's Office. In late 1987, however, while Prince was incarcerated on state charges, a task force executed search warrants on a number of Supreme Team storage locations, drug outlets, and residences. Although the gang was tipped off about the raid shortly before it occurred and was able to remove 11 kilograms of cocaine and $200,000 from targeted premises, authorities nonetheless seized an array of weapons, narcotics trade hardware, photographs, documents, and instructional manuals on criminal conduct, as well as a kilogram of cocaine and thousands of dollars. Following that raid and his own arrest by federal agents, McGriff ordered that the gang's operations be shut down. When Prince was released from prison in the spring of 1989, he began to rebuild the Supreme Team and regained control of two of its most lucrative retail locations known as Spots. The reorganized gang under Prince included Arroyo, aka C Justice, CJ for short, as the second in command, Hunt as Prince's bodyguard, Ernesto Piniella as head of security, and Hale, Jimenez, and Julio Hernandez as security workers. Tucker and Coleman managed retail spots and supervised crews of workers. Longtime gang member David Robinson, aka Bing, helped supervise the drug operations and kept records. Raymond Robinson, aka Ace, assisted in arranging cocaine purchases, provided security during drug transactions, supervised the processing of cocaine into crack, and delivered crack to sales locations. The Supreme Team began to reclaim its hold on the area drug trade and built its gross receipts up to $10,000 a day. From December 1989 to March 1990, the state was monitoring the gang's activity with wiretaps. During that period, the Supreme Team conducted its business in the Basley Park apartment of Bing's mother. 
Tucker, Coleman, and Bing would deliver to the apartment the monies received at the retail spots they supervised. Prince, and the team's primary drug courier, Trent Morris, would negotiate cocaine deals by telephone with William Graham, a supplier who had Colombian connections. And Morris and Ace would then drive to Graham's apartment with money to purchase kilogram quantities of cocaine. The cocaine would be brought back to the Robinson apartment, where it was processed as crack, packaged, and given to CJ, Bing, Tucker, or Coleman, who in turn arranged for its sale by street-level employees. The gang also resumed its use of violence and homicide. The government presented evidence at trial, not all of which resulted in convictions, of homicides committed both prior to the Supreme Team's 1987 shutdown and after its 1989 renaissance. In 1987, the Supreme Team was allied with another drug gang, led by Lorenzo, Nichols, aka, Fat Cat, that supplied the Supreme Team with powder cocaine. Nichols suspected two men, Henry and Isaac Bolden, aka, Just Me, of robbing Nichols's organization. Side note. Henry Bolden also went by the name, Rondu. He would later participate in the shooting of AZ and the murders of others inside of AZ's low spot in the Bronx. This scene was featured in the Hood classic, Paid in Full. Anyway, Rondu's brother, Just Me, was cool with Fat Cat, but he and his brother would ultimately plot and rob one of Fat Cat's spots. While Nichols was incarcerated, he sought Prince's assistance in locating the Boldens so that Nichols's crew members could kill them. To obtain that information, Prince sought the help of two corrupt New York State Parole Division employees, Parole Officer Ina McGriff, not related to Kenneth McGriff, and Secretary Ronnie Younger. Ina McGriff was responsible for supervising the parole of Supreme Team Security Chief Ernesto Piniala, but had become romantically involved with him. Younger, the secretary, had become romantically involved with Prince. The team regularly paid both women for corrupt assistance. For example, McGriff falsely certified that Piniella was in compliance with parole requirements, she and Younger provided the gang leaders with information from their parole files, false identification documents, and information about the whereabouts of other parolees, and McGriff, who as a parole officer carried a gun, supplied Supreme Team members with ammunition. Piniella and Ina McGriff testified that Prince paid the two women $3,000 for the addresses for the two Boldens and their families. Handwritten notes of such addresses were recovered in a raid of a Supreme Team apartment. The notes provided Henry Bolden's address in the Bronx, where, thereafter, he was shot, and they provided Just Me's mother's address, in the immediate vicinity of which he was thereafter shot and killed. In 1987, Nina McGriff also gave Piniella copies of parole division documents, indicating that Supreme Team member, James Page, was cooperating with authorities. Upon receiving that information, Kenneth McGriff, who had just been arrested on federal charges, ordered that Page be killed. Piniella subsequently arranged Page's murder. Gus Rivera was a Supreme Team member who had introduced the gang's leaders to some of its Colombian suppliers. According to the trial testimony, four of these Colombian drug traffickers were robbed of their cocaine and brutally murdered in July 1989 by Prince, CJ, Hale, Hunt, and Jimenez. However, other than the testimony that two of these men were known as Fernando and George, the government was unable to present evidence as to their identities, and their bodies were never identified. The jury found that these murders, alleged as RICO predicate acts, were not proven beyond a reasonable doubt. In the wake of these murders, the gang decided that Rivera was more of a liability than an asset. Accordingly, in August 1989, CJ arranged for him to be killed. Rivera was shot in the head in a Basley Park courtyard, but he survived and hid from the gang, temporarily. CJ learned Rivera's whereabouts from Rivera's girlfriend by threatening to kill her. CJ and Hale proceeded to track Rivera to a Queen's motel room, where they shot him to death. Rivera's girlfriend at the time would later testify that before his death, Rivera told her that he had killed some Colombians and had taken two keys of coke from them. Whether this is truth is unknown, as a dead person can't talk, but you may be left to think that he was involved in the robbery, but had to be clipped. Fernando Suarez and Pablo Perlaza were also Colombian suppliers to the Supreme Team. In the summer of 1989, the team decided to steal these suppliers' cocaine, rather than buy it. Accordingly, in August 1989, when Suarez and Perlaza arrived at Hale's Basley Park apartment, they were held at gunpoint by Julio Hernandez, while CJ and Hale bound them with tape. Supreme team members then tied the suppliers' heads in plastic bags. 
While Suarez and Perlaza were suffocating, Hale beat their heads with a baseball bat. Thereafter, Hunt was called upon to help dispose of the bodies. Julio Hernandez testified that Hunt asked how much did they get and showed frustration when the answer was only two keys. After he arrived, the bodies were loaded into a car and dumped in separate locations in Queens. Later, knowing that her husband had gone to meet CJ before disappearing, Suarez's wife telephoned CJ, who told her that Suarez was supposed to have met him but never arrived. In March 1990, after lengthy investigations, several members of the Supreme Team were arrested by state authorities and were charged with offenses similar to those at issue here. In a 14-count superseding indictment, the government charged all of the defendants with conducting the affairs of the Supreme Team through a pattern of racketeering, in violation of RICO, and with conspiring to distribute and to possess with intent to distribute cocaine base. All but Hunt were charged with one or more counts of distributing cocaine base at various times. At the Prince trial, the government introduced evidence of numerous killings by the Supreme Team Security Force, including evidence that Hale had killed a person named Dree, and that various others had killed several other persons who were considered to be threats to the team's operations. Those murders were not charged in this indictment though. When Hernandez was first placed in federal custody in February, he gave the government no reason to believe he would become a government witness. He provided little information when the agents urged him to cooperate and, therefore, no further meetings with him were scheduled. There was no basis for an assumption that he would become a government witness until April, when he met again with the government and made disclosures about several of the crimes charged in the indictment. In the wake of Hernandez's eventual decision to cooperate, his attorney and the assistant United States attorney discussed the possibility of separating Hernandez from the defendants, but that option was rejected because of concern that it would signal to the Supreme Team that Hernandez was cooperating and would thus endanger his family. His family's whereabouts were known to the gang, and one family member had undergone surgery and could not be relocated until after a period of recuperation. Thus, it was decided to delay Hernandez's removal from MCC until his family could be moved. Hernandez was returned to MCC, with instructions to minimize his contact with his co-defendants to the extent possible. At a later meeting with the government, Hernandez's guilty plea was scheduled for June 19, 1992, a date by which it was expected that the relocation of his family could be accomplished, and Hernandez was again instructed to avoid his co-defendants and refrain from attending their meetings to the extent possible. As it turned out, Hernandez pleaded guilty as scheduled, but the recuperating family member was still too ill to be moved at that time, so Hernandez was returned to MCC, again with the instruction to avoid his co-defendants. By July 2, 1992, Hernandez's family had been relocated, and Hernandez was promptly removed from MCC. The soundness of the concern for the safety of Hernandez's family is well documented, when Supreme Team member Trent Morris was scheduled to testify for the prosecution at Prince's state trial in 1991, Trent's brother William received communications and threats to himself and the Morris family if Trent were to testify. In anticipation of Trent Morris's testimony, his wife and child had been relocated. In a taped conversation with William Morris before that trial and after the relocation, Prince noted that Trent had sent them away, but pointed out to William, he ain't send you away, he ain't send away his moms and them, you know what I'm saying. Prince then asked whether William Morris still lived at a certain address. After receiving a negative response, Prince said, if you notice, Robin's still staying in, in Basley Projects. Robin Carrington was Trent Morris's sister-in-law who lived in the Basley Park houses with her father. Prince said, if I really wanted to do anything to anybody, it would be a snap of a finger. Regardless of the threats to persuade Trent Morris not to testify, he began his testimony against Prince in the state court trial. On that night, Trent Morris's sister-in-law Robin Carrington and her father were killed. The first letter of Prince's nickname was carved in their torsos. This basically wraps it up, though for this quick story. Prince remains in jail to this day. As always stay tuned, stay low, and thanks for watching.